Welcome to the Global Treasures Podcast. I'm Abigail Vaca. And I'm Keith Berthew. We're two wayfarers with a passion for traveling and exploring the incredible sights left behind by our ancestors. We'll spend each episode exploring these places, their history, the stories, the people who built them, restored them, and who now save them for all our benefit. So in case this is the first episode you've had the chance to listen to, or have never heard of the United Nations, we'll start by sharing a bit about what they do as an organization. The United Nations is a global organization made up of 193 participating countries that was founded in 1945 to bring together the world's nations to discuss issues around security, human rights, climate change, and other global issues to work together to find common solutions. One of the bureaus within the United Nations is UNESCO, which stands for the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. It was created to encourage the identification, protection, and preservation of cultural and natural heritage around the world considered to be of outstanding value to humanity. What makes the concept of World Heritage Sites really unique is the idea that these places belong to all people across the globe, no matter where they physically live. This agency provides emergency assistance to sites in imminent danger, protects the properties by providing training to staff that curate and work on the site, and encourages new sites to be nominated for the future. There are currently 1,157 sites across the world, with more being added every year. This ensures that we will not run out of amazing episodes to bring you. Throughout our journey exploring these sites, We're going to release episodes in the order by year the sites were originally added to the UNESCO list, starting with the first ones in 1978. With the introduction out of the way, let's dive in. In this episode, Keith and I will be introducing you to the Galapagos Islands, which were first added to the World Heritage List in 1978, with the Galapagos Marine Preserve being added later on in 2001. The Galapagos Islands are a part of Ecuador, a South American country bordering Peru and Colombia. I'm super excited about this episode because I get to get all nerdy. The biology, chemistry, ecology, and the geology of this site is absolutely incredible, and those are certainly my jam. So here we go. The Galapagos Islands were originally discovered in 1535, and given the name due to the shape of the islands, which resemble the outer shell of a giant tortoise that live on the islands. The island chain consists of 21 islands in total, and these islands are situated on a point in the Pacific Ocean where the three major ocean currents collide, creating a unique area in the sea where warm and cold water meet. This natural process creates crystal clear waters that surround the islands and foster incredibly rich marine ecosystems. The islands are far enough apart that both plant and animal species could and cannot easily migrate. And that's why the Galapagos has many endemic species. Scientists often use the word endemic to describe species that are unique to one certain place on Earth. 20% of marine species, for example, found on the Galapagos Islands are endemic. And what are these animals, you might wonder? Well, they include giant tortoises on Isabella, marine iguanas on Fernandina, blue-footed boobies, yep, you heard me right, on North Seymour, and 17 other land, marine, and avian species not found anywhere else in the world. They're also famous for fantastic volcanic formation. Colored sand beaches, including the famous red beaches of Rabida and green beaches of Floriana. The Galapagos are also visited during certain seasons by migrating whales, dolphins, hammerhead sharks, manta rays, and many other varieties of colorful fish. And if you want to see cute, Google a picture of the Galapagos sea lion. Or actually, you could just visit the Galapagos and you can swim and snorkel with them. Because the sea lions and other marine animals living in this part of the world are so sheltered, over time they've lost their fear reflex, so they're generally pretty friendly, which provides for some awesome encounters that you would not get anywhere else in the natural world. Another famous animal you'll encounter is the marine iguana. It's actually the only iguana that can hunt both on land and in the water, and it's truly a sight to behold when it swims through the water. 
Other amazing creatures are white tip reef sharks, Sally Lightfoot crabs, green sea urchins, chocolate chip sea stars, and blue footed boobies. Yeah, I needed to say that again. This bird is a favorite of visitors because of its large size and its bright blue feet. It's not endemic to the islands, however. There are also red footed boobies and Nascus boobies. Keith, I, I think we get the idea. How old are you again? All oh, right, uh, sorry about that. I got carried away. I just enjoy talking about the species of boobies on the island. Hey, just a hint. Just be very careful if you do a Google search for the images of these birds. Make sure to include birds in your shirt spotter. The Galapagos are also home to both sea and land birds, the most famous species being Darwin's finches. This species played a key role in Charles Darwin's research on the theory of evolution. Okay, Mr. Scientist. Could you explain a bit about the scientific theory? It's been more than 10 years since I learned anything about this in school, and I'm aging myself here. I'm actually really glad you asked that. This is one of those things that I wish I could educate the entire world on. My chemistry students know that this is a pet peeve of mine. So, there are two very powerful results of the scientific method, a scientific law, and a theory. Both are equally as powerful, but actually both serve a little bit of a different function. The scientific law is a statement or maybe even an equation that describes something happening in nature that has never been found to be false under any circumstances that it's been applied to. Think Einstein's E equals MC squared. A theory, on the other hand, is not mathematical, but rather an explanation of how something works that has never been found to be false under any circumstances we've thrown at it. This applies to Darwin's theory of evolution. But I could go on about this for hours. Let's get back to talking about the animals. What other species are found in the islands, Abigail? Oh, so an interesting tidbit. The Galapagos Islands have penguins. The penguins are able to thrive due to the cold current that flows up from Antarctica. You can walk among them on land or see them swimming through the water while you snorkel. Although I'd be careful getting too close, as I've heard penguins can be pretty aggressive. One of the most popular animals visitors want to see are the Galapagos tortoises. They're thought to be some of the oldest animals on Earth, since they can live well for over a hundred years. They're about four feet tall and have a massive shell, weighing up to 500 pounds. And all of this weight makes them very slow moving. Sort of on a related note, Keith, can you talk a bit about the weather? I'm interested to hear more about that since the islands are so close to the equator, yet again, they have penguins. Yeah, so being so close to the equator, The islands have the same amount of sunlight all year round, roughly 12 hours per day. If you listen to our previous episode, you learn that Quito, Ecuador is in the same country and is also almost directly on the equator as well. The temperature typically falls between 65 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit here, with the weather from January to May being the warmest and having a higher humidity. So most people have heard of the Galapagos Islands, and many know that Charles Darwin's name is linked to these islands. Let's investigate a bit of the history of the islands to understand the connection and the geological and biological importance of the site. Yeah, the scientific and cultural importance of the site cannot be overstated. And this is one of the primary reasons that this was in the group of the first 12 sites to be declared by UNESCO. The Galapagos is located on something called the Nazca Tectonic Plate. This plate is slowly but constantly moving and is heading eastward over what's called the Galapagos Hotspot. So I've heard of tectonic plates before, and I know they're the reason for the continents and oceans changing over time, but could you elaborate a bit on what a hotspot is? Yeah, this is important and it'll come up over and over again in future episodes. So a hotspot is like kind of like an extra hot area of the mantle, which is the next layer under the crust of the earth, which is the outside of the earth. So this causes magma to break through the plates above it and it forms volcanoes and lava flows. Since the hotspot doesn't move much, but the plate above it does, this creates a volcanic island chain, much like the Hawaii and Easter Island hotspots. The islands right over the hotspot are therefore the largest and newest. As you move away from that hotspot, the islands get smaller and smaller because of erosion. This means that the eastern islands, San Cristobal and Española, are millions of years older than the western islands, like Fernandina, which are probably only in the hundreds of thousands of years old, and they're actually still growing today. Island ecosystems, like the Galapagos chain, actually show the evolutionary process pretty clearly. 
because of this and Charles Darwin's work, which completely changed science. The Galapagos Islands are probably the most studied archipelago in the entire world. As I mentioned before, there's a unique set of environmental conditions that set these islands apart. The location and the currents allow for a mix of both tropical and temperate climates, and that fosters a set of complex systems of plants and animals. About 5 to 10 million years ago, the tops of the Galapagos volcanoes broke the surface of the ocean for the first time. At first, they were completely devoid of plant and animal life. Any species that arrived at the islands must have done so through some kind of long-distance means, since the nearest land was over 375 miles away. 375 miles? How did anything that couldn't fly or swim a long distance get there? There are actually two ways that plant and animal species got to the islands naturally. For this part of the history, we're going to actually ignore the third method that involves humans, bringing them purposefully or maybe unwittingly. The first method is by air, by flying, in the case of birds, which probably seems obvious, or being blown by the wind, in the case of maybe like small seeds or small species. The second method is by swimming or actually floating, sometimes with the help of a raft of tangled vegetation. The ancestors of the animals that are good swimmers, like sea lions and penguins, probably swam to the islands with the help of those good ocean currents that we were talking about earlier, while the reptiles and small mammals were probably carried to the islands from South and Central America on vegetation rafts made of, like, interwoven branches and leaves. It would have only taken a few of these rafts to watch up on shore to explain the diversity of the reptiles. The raft theory also supports why there are no native amphibians, very few mammals, but a ton of reptiles in the Galapagos. Reptiles are actually the best adapted to deal with the harsh, salty, and sunny conditions of weeks at sea. Coastal plants like mangroves that have seeds that can survive salty water are there as well. You mentioned wind earlier. I'm assuming this has a place in the theory as well? Yes. Simple plants such as mosses could travel easily by wind, but the heavier plants with larger seeds are kind of scarce in the Galapagos because those seeds would have not been able to travel as far. There are actually some exceptions, though such as dandelions, because they have like these plumed seeds designed exactly for wind transport, and they're found throughout the Galapagos to this day. So I can see how this explains certain types of plant life being found on the Galapagos, but how about the smaller creatures, like the insects and snails that are found there? Small insects actually could have also been blown by the wind, and maybe even the weaker land-flying birds probably arrived this way. The land birds in the Galapagos represent only a tiny percentage of those living on the mainland, and this is because it would have been kind of a tough journey for them. Seabirds, however, can fly really long distances really easily, so they probably just flew to the island. They also probably brought with them hitchhikers in the form of plant seeds that were attached to them. Life is amazing and always seems to find a way. I'm curious, though. If this was volcanic land, it must have been pretty inhospitable for early life, right? Very. Just getting to the islands is only one piece of the story, and that was tough enough. Now, these species had to establish themselves on the island, and then once they were there, then be able to reproduce. We can only imagine how many plant seeds arrived on the island, were deposited in probably a bad spot, and died soon upon arrival. The plants that did make it are what we would mostly consider weeds. They have like a high tolerance for tough conditions. Another problem that goes along with this is pollination. Many plants require insects or animals to pollinate, and the chance that a plant and the correct pollinator arriving together was slim to none. This explains why there are so few bright flowering plants which require animal pollinators, but there are a ton of different species of wind-pollinated plants. Okay, so you mentioned before that there was a third way, and that was humans. I'm assuming that we as a species had a big role in this. Unfortunately, yes. So in the last few centuries, humans have taken the place of birds as the primary introduction of new plants and animals to the island. Of course, many of the newer introductions have been bad for the native wildlife. Harmful species such as fire ants, goats, and blackberries, not the smartphone, have caused major harm to the Galapagos' long-established species. It's so weird to me to think of goats as invasive, given we live in Connecticut and people have them as pets. And it's interesting to hear that because I was just reading that there are even invasive plants on Antarctica now because of humans. What would you say makes the original species on the Galapagos so unique? So what makes it unique is the species are quite unbalanced compared to the species on the continents. For example, 
There are a large number of reptiles, but no amphibians. A large number of birds, but very few mammals. There aren't plants with big, large flowers and big seeds, but there are large numbers of grasses and ferns. Many of these differences were important to the establishment of the theory of evolution and also natural selection. So I'm sure that's going to be an important part of the history of the site later on. You touched on it before, but when did the world first learn about the Galapagos Islands? Yeah, the world first learned of the Galapagos when the Dominican friar Fray Tomas de Berlanga, Bishop of Panama, officially discovered the islands on March 10, 1535. The currents drove him towards the Galapagos after he set out from Panama on his way to Peru. His account is the first written record of the Galapagos, and he describes giant tortoises, inhospitable terrain, and difficulty of finding water. Actually, his arrival started the many changes to the islands we'll see over the next few centuries. Over time, these islands have attracted pirates, whalers, fishermen, scientists, colonists, and tourists. These changes resulted in the decimation of fur seals, giant tortoises, lobsters, sea cucumbers, and of course whales. The arrival of around 1,400 new species of plants and animals and large-scale changes to the ecosystems caused major damage. In particular, these changes are the most profound on the colonized islands that include Floriana, San Cristobal, and Baltra, as well as the islands that are easier to get to, such as like Española. Abigail, I know you actually did some research on the first humans to use the islands. Yeah, so the islands were first used by pirates during the 17th century. They became common along the Spanish trade routes. And these pirates were the first people to actually live on the islands, and the islands were important strategically because they were far enough from the mainland to offer escape, but still close enough to the trade routes and coastal cities for raids. They were also a useful source of food and had some fresh water, which was pretty hard to come by. In the 1680s, two gentlemen named William Dampier and William Crowley, both English, visited the islands. They made an initial chart of the islands and named many of them after English nobility. Dampier was one of the first to describe the islands when he published A New Voyage Around the World in 1697. He was the one who coined the term sea lion and added more than a thousand other words to the English language. Dampier returned to the islands in 1709, and on his trip, he found Alexander Selkirk marooned on the Juan Fernandez Islands. Fun fact for literary buffs out there, I bring this up because Selkirk provided the inspiration for Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. Oh, that's actually a pretty neat tidbit. Okay, so the last couple of episodes, you've told horrible jokes. This time it's my turn. Bite your tongue. Well, okay, listen. You mentioned pirates, okay? So what's a pirate's favorite letter? R. <laughs> you would think it's R, but it's really the C. <laughs> All right, anyway. Looking into the history of the pirates in the Galapagos, I learned that the last pirates that were recorded to visit the Galapagos was in 1720. This initial set of humans from the 1620s to the 1720s introduced some of the first invasive species and began the decline of the giant tortoises. That's truly tragic. What caused the massive impacts you spoke about? Yeah, the ecological and biological history of the islands takes a pretty dark path at this point. So by the end of the 18th century, British and American whalers caused a reduction in the whale population in the Atlantic so much that they actually started to look elsewhere, especially the Pacific. In 1788, the British whaling company Samuel Enderby and Sons sponsored one of the first major Pacific whale hunts. They returned triumphantly with over 140 tons of whale oil and 888 seal skins. All this activity caused the British Admiralty to send Captain James Colnett to study further opportunities for whaling in the Pacific. When Colnett arrived in the Galapagos in June of 1793, he prepared an updated chart of the islands and he actually renamed them. He also found an abundance of sperm whales and fur seals. Many credit him with actually establishing a post office box in Floriana, which is still an active tourist site today. This brings up another role that the Galapagos played in literature. In 1820, a sperm whale sank the Nantucket whaler Essex, approximately 1,500 or so miles west of the Galapagos. The first mate, Owen Chase, recorded the event, and his account fell into the hands of none other than Herman Melville. 
Melville combined this recording with other tales of albino sperm whales and his own life experiences to create Moby Dick in 1851. Wow, the Galapagos is building up quite the bibliography. All right, so because of new whaling expeditions, sperm whale, fur seal, and giant tortoise populations all declined tremendously during the 19th century. By 1846, tortoise losses were so severe in Floriana, they were thought to be extinct. Fortunately, in the late 1840s, Abraham Gessner, a Canadian, actually found a way to distill kerosene from petroleum, which reduced the need for whale oil required for lighting and started a rapid decline of the whaling industry worldwide. By the second half of the 19th century, low demand brought an end to Nantucket and British whaling. So we've kind of danced around it. But I think it's time we started talking about scientists' visits to the island and their realization of the importance of the Galapagos. Charles Darwin is, of course, one of them and probably the most important. Yeah, that's right. Of all the scientists to visit and study the Galapagos, Charles Darwin is the most famous and has had the most lasting influence. Early in his life, Darwin studied medicine at Edinburgh and convinced the captain of the HMS Beagle to let him aboard as the ship's naturalists. Fitzroy was taking the Beagle on a charting voyage around South America. In September 1835, the Beagle arrived at the Galapagos. Darwin visited San Cristobal Island, Floriana, Isabella, and Santiago to collect specimens. His study of the differences and variations among birds, plants, and other species led to his theory of evolution and natural selection. He published his findings much later in 1859 called On the Origin of Species and it actually changed the way humans understood nature. His theory was strengthened by the observations of the endemic species found on the islands. All of these findings are in contrary to special creation in the book of Genesis of the Bible, which was the explanation of the distribution of species on earth at the time. As a result of his incredible work, by the early 20th century, naturalists, with the support of wealthy philanthropists, started visiting the islands. All of these visits started providing material for radio stations for the United States, and articles featuring the islands started to appear in magazines such as National Geographic and Harper's. The Galapagos made the transformation from inhospitable inferno to naturalist's paradise. More changes were coming. In 1942, with the permission of Ecuador, the U.S. constructed an airbase in the islands because of its strategic location. The construction of this airbase would have long-term consequences, however. This base became home to almost 2,500 U.S. officers, as well as 750 civilians. Before this, the total population of the islands was only about 800 people, so it gives you an idea of the massive increase in population that this caused. The arrival of so many people increased the demand for water, fish, and agricultural products. As a result, a pipeline was constructed to carry water from the highlands to Rec Bay and San Cristobal and also barges were used to transport water to Baltra Island. The airport was later modernized to serve as the main entry point for most travelers to the Galapagos. Following World War II, scientists started to push for conservation and restoration efforts. In the 1930s, concerns led the government of Ecuador to adopt a decree protecting key species and controlling visiting yachts. In 1936, a U.S. Tariff Act and Customs Order was passed mandating confiscation of all Galapagos fauna taken in violation of this law. In the same year, the Ecuadorian government declared the Galapagos Islands a national reserve and established a scientific commission to design a plan for the conservation of the islands. In the 1950s, supporters of the conservation of the islands lobbied the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which was the IUCN, and you might have heard of this next one, the United Nations Educational scientific, and cultural organization, UNESCO, to examine the islands and these supporters led a four-month expedition to the islands in 1957 and presented their findings to both organizations. These reports called for immediate action. In 1959, Ecuador passed a law establishing the Galapagos Islands as a national park and also banned the capture of species such as iguanas and tortoises. In 1961, Work done through the Charles Darwin Research Station initiated plans to remove invasive species, such as the removal of goats from Sur Island. It always ends with goats, apparently. In 1969, the government further defined the borders of the park, 
leaving only about 3% of the land area for residents, and these borders hold true today. By 1973, there were 18 dedicated staff working on the islands. In 1974, the Ecuador government published the first National Park Master Plan for Remediation. The Charles Darwin Station is currently conducting more research and conservation programs. As an example, it is currently breeding and releasing captive tortoises and iguanas. In looking to the future, the islands face new challenges that have to be addressed. One of the problems facing the islands is one that all islands around the world face, and that is changes in Earth's overall climate. The Galapagos are more susceptible to these changes because of the isolation. Furthermore, much of the islands are low-lying, and the sea level increase has the potential to be devastating. This combined with warmer sea temperatures, greater intensity of both El Nino and La Nina events, increased population, acidification of the oceans, and the reduction in cold water upwelling, which brings nutrients to the ocean surface, all have the potential to irreparably damage the site. Humans' efforts to curb these changes are integral to preserving this magnificent ecosystem. I really hope all of this information drives people to want to visit, but please do so responsibly. So, for those who do want to travel to the Galapagos, I want to share some information about how to get there and how to get around once you arrive. Typically, travelers will get to the Galapagos by flying to Quito, Ecuador first, and then flying into San Cristobal Airport or Seymour Airport. A lot of people use the day-long layover to see a bit of Ecuador before making their way to the islands as well. If you want to travel between the different islands, you can take the ferries or flights that depart daily. Also, another note, we sort of touched on this before, but do not, I, I repeat, do not take a single stone or grain of sand from any of the islands. As we stated before, it's illegal, and my understanding is there could be serious consequences. So, once you are there, cruise ships or land tours are really the best way to see the islands. There are many all-inclusive cruise itineraries, but... Just be warned, they are not cheap. Plus, the Galapagos charges travelers a Galapagos National Park entrance fee at the airport. I also want to mention for people like myself who travel with lots of snacks, due to the wildlife, they do not allow travelers to bring fruits and vegetables, so make sure you do your research before you pack your popcorn. Are you saying this isn't a place you can just wing it without reservations? It sounds like you might need to do some major planning before your visit. Definitely not. Tourism is their economy. On that note, I suggest visiting months such as May and December, which seem to be the slowest. You should still plan everything in advance, but at least there will be smaller crowds. That makes sense. The weather is still a bit cooler and the kids are still in school. I was impressed by the variety of accommodations I saw as well. Apparently, you can stay in Airbnbs, hostels, fancy five-star hotels that are all-inclusive, So, while it's still expensive, you can adapt it to your budget somewhat. And I thought I would mention for anyone planning on brushing up on their language skills, Spanish is the primary language. Yeah, my understanding is that English is widely spoken on the larger islands, though. And on that note, I'll segue into talking a bit about the demographics, culture, and food. As of 2022, over 145,000 people visit the Galapagos annually whereas the population on the islands itself is a little over 33,000 people, with the largest group of residents identifying ethnically as Ecuadorian mestizos, which is timely given we just covered Quito. Also, only five of the islands actually are inhabited currently. I also want to talk about the cuisine. Some of this will be familiar for those who listened to the last episode, again, because the Galapagos are owned by Ecuador. So, ceviche is one popular dish, as well as concalagua, which is the Galapagos spin on the soup, with shellfish only found in the islands. So again, a lot of seafood-based dishes, which makes sense. Okay, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about my favorite topic, urban legends and cryptozoology. Well, of course. Ironically, I came across two stories. Both happen to be true, as in what you're about to hear actually happened and are more wild than anything paranormal I could share with all of you. The first centered around a sailor named Patrick Watkins, who got marooned on one of the islands in the early 1800s. He survived by hunting and trading with visiting sailors. He ended up developing a crew over time, almost like a pirate crew, who helped him steal a boat and make his way back to Guayaquil? 
Ecuador. However, when he got to the mainland, he was the only one left. Well, what happened to the rest of them? He says they died from lack of water, but there are rumors that he killed them because there wasn't enough water to go around. Bakes. That sounds like a horror movie. Wait until you hear the second story. So, there was an incident called the Galapagos Affair. It all started in the year 1929, when a doctor named Friedrich Ritter decided to stop practicing medicine and moved to the Galapagos Islands. He left behind his wife and brought one of his patients, Dore, with him. Later, two other couples came to the island, one being the Whitmer family, and the other being a baroness named Eloise Werbron de Wanger Bosquet and her two boyfriends, Robert Philipson and Rudolf Lorenz. I suppose the fact she had two boyfriends in the 1920s was scandalous in itself. So, Dr. Ritter and the Whitmers didn't really talk to one another. It seems like they were hermits, and that worked well for them. However, the Baroness was a gossip and had plans to build her own hotel on the island. Her presence brought in travelers because she gained worldwide recognition as a pistol-toting debutante. Obviously, this did not please the other residents on the island who wanted privacy, and she just didn't get along well with the Whitmers or Dr. Ritter as a result. And then, as time went by, her two boyfriends started fighting, and Lorenz became close friends with the Whitmers. The Whitmers also grew increasingly suspicious that she was doing things like speaking ill of them to visitors, who in turn shared misinformation about them to the press. And then, things got even stranger. Philipson stole the Ritter's donkey one night, and in the morning, it ended up getting shot. The donkey gets shot? Just wait, it gets better. In March of 1934, the Baroness and Philipson went missing. By Miss Whittemer's account, the Baroness told her that friends had arrived on a yacht, and they were all going to Tahiti together. The Baroness left everything behind with Lorenz, and after that, the Baroness and Philipson were never seen again. So I'm guessing this wasn't as simple as they made it out to be then. No, because the thing is, inconsistency started popping up with the Whitmer story. First of all, no one else remembers any yachts or ships arriving during that time frame, and there are no accounts or records stating that the Baroness or Philipson were ever in Tahiti. Plus, she left behind personal items that she always had on her when she lived on the island. Some of the residents believe that the Baroness and Philipson were murdered by Lorenz, the other boyfriend, and that maybe the Whitmers were involved or helped in some way. And then things get crazier. Lorenz disappears as well. I guess Lorenz had enough of all this craziness, and he convinced a Norwegian fisherman named Nuggerud to take him to San Cristobal Island, where he could catch a ferry to the mainland. They made it to Santa Cruz, but disappeared between Santa Cruz and San Cristobal. Months later, the mummified bodies of both men were found on Marchena Island. There was no clue as to how they got there. And incidentally, this island is one of the northernmost islands and not anywhere near Santa Cruz or San Cristobal. And are you ready for more twists and turns? Holy smokes, I can barely keep up with my notes here. I've got like a map of all these people who killed each other. In November of the same year, though, Dr. Ritter died. His death was ruled a result of food poisoning, with his wife stating that he ate bad meat. However, he was noted as being a vegetarian, although apparently not a strict one. Many believe that his girlfriend, Dore, poisoned him, as it sounds like he was kind of abusive towards her. And to this day, no one actually knows what happened, and whether this was all a mere coincidence or something straight out of a Hollywood movie. Well, that's one way to wrap up a UNESCO site. As always, and with any World Heritage site, if you want to support the upkeep of this marvel, you can make a donation to UNESCO World Heritage Online. The other, and even more important way that you can support these sites, is by visiting them. It's a double bonus. You get to see these incredible sites and support them at the same time. It's what we hope you do, and the main reason that we are so passionate about UNESCO sites, and also why we want to share them with you. Thank you for listening to the Global Treasures podcast. If you would like to support the show, 
You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. See you next time.